So thank you, welcome. I'm Betty Martin. This um, is a session of the uh, Eros Tantra Festival. And um, we're here to talk about generosity and the wheel of consent. And a little about me, I'm, uh, I'm a mother, a grandmother, a communitarian. I live in an intentional community near Seattle, Washington. I'm a retired sex worker. And before that, a retired chiropractor. So I have had my hands on people professionally for over 40 years, which is a lot of people. And I've learned some things about touch. I've learned some things about desire and about consent. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. <laughs> Who here has heard of the wheel of consent and has some inkling of what it may be? Great. And who here are completely new and maybe you're here because you're curious about generosity. Okay, okay, great, thank you. So let's see where to start. I think I'm gonna start by, well, let's, let's just talk about a scenario. So you're rolling around in bed with your sweetie and they want to do something to you, that's a kind of okay. It doesn't really grab you, but it, you know, it's not terrible. And, but you want to be generous with yourself. And how do you notice how much you're willing to give and where you start to draw the line? Anybody better ever been in such a position and had that wondering of, where do I draw the line here? What's too much? What's still okay? And do you, do you assume that if only you were more generous, you could be able to give a little more? Anyone ever think that? What's wrong with me that I can't let them do this thing that they wanna do that I'm too uptight to do? Anybody ever felt that? Um, so that's what we're gonna talk about. And I'm gonna define the wheel of consent to start with. The wheel of consent is a practice. It doesn't replace your life. It doesn't apply to every incident and every interaction in your life, but it's a practice in taking, receiving and giving a part so that you're either receiving a gift and we'll talk about what kinds of gifts those might be. You're either receiving a gift, it's totally your turn. It's all about you. You still respect the boundaries of the other person, of course, but you put your desires first. It's about taking that apart, receiving from giving in which it's about the other person. You're, it's not about what you want. What you want doesn't matter. Your boundaries matter, of course. And it's up to you to, to respect those. But in taking them apart so that you are receiving a gift or giving a gift, why bother? What happens when you do that? It may not sound very tantric, but actually it is, I think. Um, what happens is that it allows you certain experiences that are possible no other way. There are experiences that you can have when it's all about you that are not available when you're trying to mix it up and trying to give and take and please everybody. There are experiences that are not possible any other way. And the same with giving. There are experiences when you're setting aside what you want and giving what the other person wants that are not possible when you're mixing them up and trying to get something back. So the wheel of consent is a practice in taking those two apart. For one reason, so you have those experiences. And the other reason is that you find out what they are. To have the experience of receiving a gift from another person that we have asked for, it's what we want, it opens our hearts, it feeds our hearts in a certain way. 
And until you experience that without trying to give something back, you can't really know what receiving is because it's not happening until you stop trying to give something back at the same time. Has anybody ever had the experience where maybe you're, you're getting a nice massage or maybe you're getting a nice hand job or some, something else that's really lovely, but you wanna make sure your giver's happy so you're trying to give something back to your giver to make them feel good. Anybody ever done that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Does it work? <laughs> well, it, it can kind of work, sort of, but you don't really receive the gift and take it in and let it feed your heart um, that way. So the wheel of consent is a practice in taking them apart so you can experience each one. Does that dynamic apply to every human interaction? No, thank God. There are times when neither of you is giving or receiving when you're just hanging out together, maybe taking a walk or playing or something else that you both enjoy, that you are not setting aside your wants. Um, you're not putting your wants forward. You're kind of playing in the middle. And that's the, that for many people, that's the ideal. And that's where they think they are most of the time. But what's really happening usually with that is that you're just trying to avoid the vulnerability of the receiving side. Does this ring a bell? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah, it's a practice. It does not replace your life. It doesn't apply to every single interaction. But as a practice, when you come into the practice and you, you set a container, okay, let's play the game for 20 minutes or an hour or whatever you have. And then you play the practice and you're very attentive and you're kind of strict with the structure. Then you learn some things about yourself. Then you close the practice and you go back to your regular life. And then whatever you learned, you take with you. Um, and then you'll apply it however you apply it. That will be up to you. Questions about that? Does that make sense so far? Great. Okay, so. It's a practice. It's also a model that grew out of the practice. And the model is that there's a difference between who is doing and who it's for. So I could be running my hand down your back. And it may be lovely for both of us. And I may be doing it for you, in which case, I want to know which way you want my hand to go. Or, and in this case, I'm giving you that gift of my action. Or you may be giving me the gift of your body and it's all about me getting a good feel of your back, in which case my hand's going where I want it to go. And there's a very significant difference between both of those two experiences. In the, in the first one, I'm giving you the gift of my action. I'm touching you the way you want. I'm going the way you want. And in the second one, you're giving me the gift of access to your body. I get to play and explore and feel you up in the way that I want, respecting your limits, of course, but following my desire. And the difference between those is significant. And that's what the wheel of consent is about. Noticing that there's two very different kinds of gifts here that can be given and received. One is the gift of action. And that's what most people think of when they think of receiving and giving. In fact, for a lot of people, we use the words interchangeably. When you say give, the picture in your mind is you're doing, yeah? Um, and when you say the word receive, you might think, well, that means I'm being done to. And so then you think, well, if 
I'm being done to and I'm receiving than that's supposed to be for me, but it might not feel like it's for you. Have you ever been touched and you didn't really feel like it was for you? Yeah, yeah. Um, almost every woman or person who's been raised as a girl has had this experience of being touched in a way that was supposed to be for you, but really didn't feel like it was for you. And is this ringing bells? Yeah, it's true for many men as well, but it's pretty endemic for women. Um, so yeah, two different kinds of gifts. You can give the gift of your actions or you can give the gift of your body. Questions? Is this making sense so far? So the wheel of consent um, draws two lines and I'll show you one a little while later. It, it, so that you're either receiving or giving and that you're either doing or done to and those combine in four different ways. So they combine like this. I'm doing what I want or I'm doing what you want or you're doing what I want or you're doing what you want. And that creates the four quadrants. Um, Yeah, I, I think that's the that's the most basic description of the wheel of consent that I can give. Um, does this ring true with what you've seen already, or does it answer questions about that have come up about what you've seen already? Any thoughts there, or questions about it? Okay. Um, and da, 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 this is a very resonant in the BDSM kink world, top, bo top bottom, dom, sub. That is right. Um, there's an interesting overlap in the uh, kink and BDSM world with the terms top and bottom. Does it mean the does top mean the person who's doing or does it mean the person who's in charge and those two are not always the same i can flog you for my pleasure or i can flog you for your pleasure or i can flog you for an audience so it, who's doing is a different question than who's in charge or who it's for yeah Um, so let's talk about receiving and giving a little more, uh, uh, because this is where the generosity piece comes in. I started playing, well, the wheel of consent was developed because I started playing a game called the three minute game, which you can look up on YouTube if you haven't seen it already. Um, which I learned at a body electric school workshop 20 years ago. And it was a BDSM based workshop. And the game was two people asking each other two questions. And the two questions are, and um, Gustavo, would you mind writing these in the chat, please? Because I can't type and talk at the same time. The two questions are, how, what do you want me to do to you for three minutes? That's question one. And question two is, what do you want to do to me for three minutes? Got those? Great. What do you want me to do to you for three minutes? And what do you want to do to me for three minutes? And um, I learned that in a workshop when I was seeing clients at that time, and I, uh, I took this game home to play with my clients because I thought, oh, this is going to be a nice transition from um, the talking history taking part of the session into the touch and play part of the session. 
and it, it did show me that it showed me really quite a lot more and um and as i began diving into it then that's where these quadrants became clear because if i'm asking you what you want to do to me then it's about what you want and i'm going to be done to in the way that you want when you ask me what when i ask you what i want you to do then it's about me so that those distinctions became clear right away um so yeah so so the three minute game started out with what do you want me to do to you and what do you want to do to me and i learned pretty quickly that it there was the question was kind of too broad for the particular way that i was working so i narrowed it down to how do you want to touch me and how do you want me to touch you and i found that if people got very confused so if i ask you right now how do you want me to touch you what's your first response what's your first thought for a lot of people it's i have no idea no one's ever asked me that many many people said that no one's ever asked me that, which I totally believe. And I don't have any idea. Or they would say, well, you can do whatever you want. And that might be true, but it's a different question. I asked you what you wanted. And you answered with what you don't mind terribly much. That's a very different question. Um, or they might say, well, you know, you're, you're the expert. What do you think I should want? And which I usually say, well, I am the expert. And my expertise says that you need to learn how to ask the way you want. So we're going to stay right there. Um, so, yeah, what I learned by asking people what they wanted is that very often they didn't know. And then they would feel pressure to, oh, I got to figure it out, which is totally understandable. And again, it showed me that, well, they don't really realize it's their turn because if it's your turn, you can take all the time in the world to figure out what you want, like, because it's your turn. Um, and I learned that most people don't know how to have it be for them. And then if they did, say they were able to ask for, oh, you know, would you scratch my head or would you rub my shoulders? And then I would do that. And they still were not quite sure it was for them because they wouldn't ask for changes if they wanted to change or they would keep going even after they wanted to stop. But one, uh, at a little workshop one time, a gal said, well, you know, the first minute was really great and then I spent the next two minutes wondering if it was okay to ask my partner to go lighter. And, you know, it's easy to see in somebody else because you say, well, why would you, why, why wouldn't you? Because it's your turn, but we've all been there. I've been there. I have so been there many times, even occasionally on the massage table where I know it's for me but I put up with something that's not really what I want. Anybody else been there? Yeah, yeah, we've all been there, yeah. And so we sometimes somehow have this idea that this thing is happening to us and we're supposed to like it, even if we don't like it. And what's wrong with us, we should like it. Is this ringing a bell? Um, so yeah, that's one of the ways that we get confused when it's really our turn and we start acting like it's for somebody else, or we don't really know how to have it be really for us. And it's understandable because when we were small children, before we could talk, every one of us has been touched in ways that we did not want, we did not like, and were powerless to prevent. And even in the very best of circumstances, maybe your parents were terrific, but you still 
you know, you get your diaper, diapers changed, you get your uh, teeth brushed, you get picked up when you didn't want to be picked up. So we've all been, um, we've all been touched in ways that we did not want. And so we grow up with this body knowing that touch, oh, that's this thing that happens to you and you just have to deal with it somehow. Yeah. And so then we grow up and we might have a chance to learn that um, we do get a choice, but we might not get a chance to learn that. We really don't know. So my mission is for people to have a chance to learn that. Yeah, here's a, when I first learned about consent, it was hard for me to put up boundaries without being very curt or offending someone. Yes, that's this, this rings true. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, it took me a long time to feel comfortable expressing boundaries clearly and lovingly. Would love if you have more tips on scenarios and how to express our limits. That's a great question. And we're actually gonna practice shortly. Um, so yeah, I think the first, uh, so let me see if I finish that thought before I move on to this other one. So yeah, we all have experience with being touched in ways we did not want or like. For some, it was minor. For some, it was truly horrendous. But as adults, we have the opportunity to learn and to notice that we do have a choice about it and to learn how to exercise that choice of how do you want to touch me? Oh, oh, hmm, that's a good question. How would I like to touch you? Oh, would you scratch my head for a few minutes? Or, oh, would you rub my back? Or, oh, would you hold my feet? Or, oh, would you spank me? Or whatever it is. And so then we ask for that. And the other person can say yes or no, or yes only to hear. And so we gradually learn that we do in fact have a choice. A great example, uh, as a side note, a great example of how to learn this in a really rich way is called a bossy massage. That's on YouTube, you can look it up. Um, where you get to say exactly how you're touched and nothing happens except exactly what you ask for. So it makes it very difficult not to notice that you are in fact in charge of how you're touched for this time. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about, now we're gonna get over into what, what the heck does it have to do with generosity anyway? So let's talk about um, when someone asks you, okay, will you scratch my back? Or may I play with your back? Or may I um, nuzzle your neck? Or may I spank you? Or may I feel up your legs? Or will you, um, Will you rub my feet? Will you scratch my back? Will you kiss me on the eyelids? Now it's up to you to say yes or no, or tell me more, or um, yes only to hear, or yes only for five minutes. So this is where, this is where it's time to exercise a boundary and set a limit. This is where saying no comes in. Um, and I'll get to what this has to do with generosity in a minute. So imagine, here's a thought experiment. Imagine you go into a room, and the room is filled with people. And the rule when you walk in the room is that you are not allowed to say no to anyone there. You have to do whatever they ask. Can you walk into the room? Not really. You can't, you can't even go in the room because you have no idea what they're going to ask for. So it's an extreme example, but it shows you that 
how crucial it is that you can say no. And that it's your ability to say no that lets you walk into the room with anyone. If you can't say no, you can't afford to be in the same room with anyone because there's no telling what they might ask for. So saying no is, is the, the primary skill that allows you to get close to anyone. Just chew on that for a minute. Saying no is the primary skill that allows you to get close to anyone at all. And it's hard. It can be really hard to say no. Anyone else have this struggle sometimes? And it depends on the situation. For some people, it's much harder um, to say no if you're in a group, for example. And it's easy when you're just one-on-one. -on -one. And for somebody else, it's easy when you're one-on-one, -on -one, but hard when you're in a group. Or did I mix that up? Anyway, uh, for somebody else, maybe it's hard with a lover, but easy with a boss. Somebody else, it's hard with a boss, but easy with a lover. So it's just going to be, it's different for everyone. Um, but yeah. It, we just have to be able to say no. That presumes, well, yeah, that presumes that someone is actually asking. And people don't always ask, do they? They may start, may put a hand somewhere that you don't want it. And you have to either verbally say no or stop or move their hand away. And we're afraid to say no because why? Go ahead and put some things in the chat. What makes it hard to say no? Yeah, we want to be liked, self-worth. Self-worth meaning we think that we're worth more if we can say yes. Yeah, we're afraid of confrontation. Oh yeah, I, I really relate to that one. Fear of rejection and then ending up alone, fear of being lonely, totally. We're taught condition that saying no kept us safe. Yeah, yeah. Afraid of how the group reacts. Don't want to hurt the other. I'm not clear about what I want. Oh yeah. These are great. And they are all ringing bells probably for all of us, yeah? Fear of how we're received, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Confrontation, you bet, you bet. I think oftentimes it's a fear of a loss of connection. We don't realize that we can stay connected with the person even if we say no to the activity. So then what do you do instead if you don't say no? Go back to the chat again. What do you do if you can't say no? What ends up happening? You go along with everything, you freeze, Connections in the no because it's honest. Yeah, I don't communicate and comply. Yeah, you can feel like a victim, which you might be. Um, second guess myself. Oh yeah, that's that's really good. Boundary gets crossed even if you couldn't articulate the boundary. Absolutely, absolutely. And then you can get mad at the other or blame them. Yeah, yeah. You can get resentful, my favorite. Yeah, I used to be the queen of resentment. Um, and regret it later, yep, 
that's a good one too. So all kinds of things happen when we don't listen to our own no and say no. So what does this have to do with generosity? Aren't we supposed to be able to give more? Here's what I found out about generosity. That when someone asks me for something that I want, and I am in the position where I may be giving, it's my job to stay responsible for my limits, for my nose. It's my job. Nobody else can do that for me. Nobody can guess what I'm okay with and what I'm not. I am the only one who knows when I listen to myself, what I'm okay giving and what I'm not. So it's up to me. And when I keep that responsibility, when I speak up for myself, when I say no or stop or um, not today, but ask me next Friday, or yes, you can feel my leg only up to here, or yes, I can rub your back, but only for about 10 minutes. When, when I stay responsible for those limits, then something kind of magical happens. I relax because I'm no longer worried about what they might ask for. If I can't say no, then I'm worried, well, they're gonna ask for this or, oh, what if they ask for that and then I have to do that? And, oh, what if they ask for this? And then, I, or what if they try this? And then I'll go, look, this ring a bell? You've been there? I've been there. Yeah. So, so the more responsibility I take for owning my no and speaking my no, speaking my only to hear, speaking my only for this long, um, then I relax. And then within those limits that I have set, I have a tremendous experience of generosity. I can feel very generous within those limits that I have set. And it's a wonderful feeling. It's a wonderful feeling. Is this ringing? Is this ringing true? Yeah, yeah. So the secret to generosity turns out to be not trying to stretch yourself and trying to give more and trying to give more and trying to give more. The secret to generosity is really honoring your no and your limits. And like, I can give you this, I cannot give you this. And then you relax and then you, then within those limits that you have set, you feel very generous and you, and you act very generous because it's given a gift. It's a gift you're giving with a full heart instead of a, oh, I guess so. I guess I have to, because I can't say no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Questions you can raise your hand and speak them or you can put it in the chat or other observations that you've had about this fact that being responsible for our limits is what allows us to be generous within those limits. Yeah. Yeah. um, Chris. Yeah. The, the, the um how do you how do you suggest breaking old patterns of saying yes because a lot of mine like I'm the youngest of five kids anytime anybody wanted anything I was the bottom of the pecking order and as soon as my name was called people weren't asking me if I was having a nice day they wanted something from me yeah. and I would always do it so yeah. my default is yes yeah. And I have a real hard time with setting boundaries with people and saying no. And like you'd mentioned, yeah. there's so many situations where I've done things. I've helped people move house. I've yeah. done all these sort of things when my body is saying, no, yeah. no, 
but I just yeah. do it anyways and then resent them later. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not sure how they're going to edit this, but in case they edit that out for privacy, I'll re repeat the question, which is how to um, how to change a long a lifelong pattern of saying yes um, to be able to learn to say no. And as you, as you noted, it starts in childhood for lots of reasons. Because one for one thing, we think it helps keeps us safe, which it does. Um, we don't get if we say yes, we don't get clobbered. If we say no, we might get clobbered. Um, that's a great question. And here's what I like to do. Here's what I would do with clients when I was seeing clients. We would just have a practice and say, okay, we're going to practice saying no. And I'm just going to keep asking you a bunch of stuff. And you're going to say no with as many different tones of voice as you can. So may I scratch your back? Uh, no. May I lick your toes? No. May I pull in your hair? No. No. Not on your fucking life. You know, try that again. I'll rip your throat out. Like just oh, totally overdo it so that you're practicing. And pretty soon you'll be rolling in laughter and perhaps tears because these kinds of patterns, they're in there and they're, uh, the reason they have a hold on us is because we have feelings about them. And so as we let them go, the feelings will often come up. The laughter is a release of emotional tension, the tears, you know, um, you may also feel angry and you'll remember that this person's here to practice with you. They're not actually the original perpetrator. Um, but setting up a time like that to practice is a lot of fun and can just really break through a lot. Um, so, so that's something that I used to do with clients and I've had, it, it, with, with partners, if you try it, some partners have a relationship in which um, you really can explore this kind of thing and you're there to support each other. Some relationships can't tolerate that much truth telling and for them it's hard. And so I just want to acknowledge that. Um, so if it doesn't feel doable with your partner, you might have uh, a listening buddy or a co-counselor that you talk with or uh, another buddy who's in the a, a growth program or healing program of some kind that you're in that you can just say, let's practice this, let's play with this. And we're actually gonna do this here shortly after a break. Yeah, yeah. The other way is to play the three minute game and just keep practice saying no, because the three minute game, when you have it, when it's in a container, um, it's for, the purpose of experimenting and learning. Yeah. Ben. Uh, Other people notice this, that when you're, when you say no, the, uh, not only does it let you relax, it lets the other person relax because they don't have to worry about taking care of you and worrying about stepping over your boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. And Francesca on my list of rewards <laughs> it's like oh that sounds really fun can I have that too <laughs> so what this person I've seen the recording is pausing and starting again so what this person said was that they they um had worked as a dom and they noticed that just saying the word no is very difficult for people and so and this is true in our private lives as well and so exploring different ways to say no and the example that they gave was i'm not comfortable with that or i'm not available for that and there are lots of ways to say no my friend marcia baczynski at um, asking for what you want.com which i'm putting in the chat asking for what you want.com has a little page you can download that says you know 20 different ways to say no um, I'm not available for that. I'm not comfortable with that. That doesn't work for me. 
Um, I appreciate you asking, but it's not something I'm up for. And also those kinds of things can help to keep the connection, even though you're a no to the activity, you wanna stay connected to the person. So it, in real life, it does help to give, you don't have to give an excuse. No does not need a meaning, I mean, a, a reason. It can just be no because you don't feel like it. And if you wanna keep the connection with the person and uh, sweeten the, the relating, it does help to make a little more of a sentence. In the exercises though, we encourage you to just say the word no so that you can not be afraid of it anymore. But in real life, yeah, it, it does help to say, to say uh, more of a sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other thoughts or noticings about that so far? So you, we came here to talk about generosity and we ended up talking about having boundaries and setting limits and saying no and who thought it would go there. <laughs> but that is the key to generosity is respecting your own no and, and, and developing your comfort and ability to say no in all the various forms of the ways that we say no. So we're gonna take a five minute break and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna play with this. And what I'm going to invite you to do is I'm gonna ask for a couple of people to come into the middle and either play with each other or play with me. And we'll just practice some saying no and see all the hilarity that ensues, okay? So come back uh, at straight up the hour. It's two o'clock here. I don't know what time it is where you are. Come back at straight up the hour and uh, let's pause the recording, of course. To do, I'm going to invite you to join me in playing with this. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna spend just a few minutes, maybe three or four minutes, and we'll have two people spotlighted in the center so it's easy to see. And we'll just practice asking each other questions of favors that we might want or something that we might want the other person to do or something might, we might want to do to them. Um, and we're just going to say no to every request. And we're going to play with it to we invite you to play with as many different ways of saying no as you can. And just to, it just sort of breaks the ice and starts to get real funny. And, and um, uh, it just, yeah, it's just a way to play with it. Um, Absolutely. One thing that we, any other noticings that want to be shared? Um, this person a moment ago was noticing that sometimes uh, hearing a no feels like it's about the person who's saying no, and sometimes it feels more personal. And so being able to distinguish between those is helpful. Um, anybody else want to share anything about what they noticed about that little exercise? Yeah. Just think in, in the, um, you know, the, the question is often, well, how do I know if I'm a no? And I, I can't always tell, is this, are, is this recognizable for people? You're not always sure, or you can't always tell. Yeah. So here's a little exercise to do with just yourself. So you don't need anybody else for this one. And just find a comfortable space spot in your chair or wherever you, you are and just notice say the word no to yourself or say it out loud actually and notice what happens in your body just say the word no a few times no no And what do you notice in your chest and in your belly? 
and in your hips, maybe your shoulders, maybe your throat, maybe your feet. Say the word no to yourself and include a gesture if you want. Maybe holding your hands up and crossing or no. Mm. And go ahead and share in the chat what you notice about your body and your sensations. What does you what does a no feel like in your body? One person says surprisingly grounding retraction. Um, I noticed that my gut got tight on edge. Yeah. You might also notice a kind of freedom, vibrant and clear, one person says. Yeah. My throat got tight. Very uncomfortable for me, one person said. Yeah. Yeah. Tense, but at the same time, liberating. Solar plexus activation, powerful. I feel defensive. Guilt. Yep. Yeah. Now imagine that no was on behalf of someone that you cared very much about. Maybe there's a child behind you and a bear coming at the child. Or maybe there's a, a, a partner or you when you were a child. So you're gonna protect this other person. Now try it again and see if that changes at all. So you're gonna say no or stop. See how that feels in your body. And say it out loud if you want to. Stop. No. How does that feel in your belly, in your chest, your hips, maybe your neck, maybe your arms? And go ahead and put in the chat what you noticed about yourself in that. I noticed the kind of a power in feeling protective, clear, confident, powerful, right. Yeah. Yeah. More confident. Yeah. Pride. It's a very different feeling, isn't it? I'm not sure what to make of it. Very different for me, strong and assertive is if the no is on someone else's behalf. That's so interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of the opposite of guilt. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I will let you take what you like from that for noticing that little difference, but it might be something about, well, what if I was that small person that was really worth protecting? Okay, switch gears. Um, now imagine, a, it's a first practice, steel doors closing, second practice, strong gold staff, which none shall pass. Oh yeah, 
<laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, so now switch gears. So now see what a yes feels like in your body. Just say the word yes. Oh, hell yes. And see what you notice with that. Come on, baby. Yes. What does your chest feel like in your belly? Maybe your hips, maybe your arms, maybe your face. And if you like, go ahead and put in the chat what you notice about your body. One person says expansive, excited, powerful, cheerful. Yeah, chest open. I feel, for me, I feel like a, a, a kind of fluttery excitement in my up grip and the upper chest energy flowing. Yeah. So the ability to check in and notice what your body is saying, this person says sexy and fizzy. The ability to check in and notice how is my body responding to this opportunity or this option in front of me. That is a skill which seems to me the basis of any other kind of skill and any other kind of relationship skill is that ability to, to notice what's my body saying? Yeah. Legs of an octopus reaching out of my belly. Well, that was an unexpected vision. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, switch gears one more time. Notice what a maybe feels like. And I'm gonna come back and talk again a minute about what to do if it's a maybe, but what's a maybe feel like? Uh, maybe, hmm, maybe uh, I feel my, my eyebrows um, tilting. Feels like a no. Mm -hmm. What are other noticings about maybe one shoulder goes back and one shoulder goes forward? Yeah. What are there noticings about what's a maybe feel like in your gut, your chest? Depends on the tone, anything from playful to anxiety inducing. Yep, great. It feels like 70% no. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, one of the things that I do in my life is facilitate cuddle parties. And I highly recommend them any chance you have to go to them. And um, the rule number five for cuddle party is if you're a maybe, say no. And that's because oftentimes we use maybe just to avoid the discomfort of saying no. Anybody ever done that? I've done that, yeah. And sometimes we, we really genuinely don't know and saying no gives you some closure and you can always come back and revisit it. So one approach to saying maybe, to feeling maybe is to say no. And that's a rule that I use in my life a lot uh, which I'm very glad to have. Um, someone says chest fluttering. Yeah. Something else that I've that I've realized about a maybe is that a maybe can mean number one, there's some more information that you need. Maybe this person wants to. Um, uh, maybe this person wants to give you a massage 
well, maybe, but what you, what I need is more information about why, what does that mean to you? Or what do you have in mind? Or um, how long are you thinking? Or are you thinking with close on or close off? So sometimes when we have a no, it's just, we have a maybe, it's just that there's some information we need and we need to just ask that information. Sometimes when we don't know, it's that we need more time. So one way to answer that is, I'm not sure, I'll get back to you on that. Or, um, I don't know, Let me, give me a few minutes to think about that. Or hold on a minute, let me just check in with myself. And can you imagine what, what would change in your sensual and sexual life if you had that in your, as part of your, part of your um, uh, script is, you know what, I don't know, hang on. Let me think about that a moment. Let me feel into that a moment. Another thing that a maybe could be is that there's a limit, but you're not quite sure what it is yet. So maybe something that, yeah, someone asked me for a, a massage. Um, I'm a yes, but only if it's, I can only give you about 20 minutes. Does that still interest you? Or yes, but only to hear. Or yes, but I can't do it today, I could do it on Friday. So there may be a yes, but, um, but there's a limit and you haven't really figured out what your limit is. So you're not a full yes. Does this make sense? Um, don't feel, okay, so someone's saying, uh, okay, wait a minute, let me finish this first thought. Um, so if, you, if you're not really a clear yes or not really a clear no, it's one of three things. One is that there's more information you need. The second thing is that there's a limit you need to set, but you haven't figured out what it is yet, or you know what it is and you haven't spoken it yet. And the third is it's a no trying to get you to hear it. So sometimes we have a no inside, but we're not listening to it. You ever been there? Yeah, that, okay. If I really listen to myself, it'd be a no, but I'm trying to override the no. So I'm trying to make myself say yes. Yeah, I've been there many times and I think we all have, yeah. So if, it's, if you're not a clear yes, but you're not a clear no, it's probably one of those three. It's a limit waiting for you to, it's a no waiting for you to hear it. It's a limit that you haven't set yet or it's more information that you need. And generally speaking, slowing down and giving yourself some time will allow you to check in with what, it, what your limit actually is. Let's look at this question. Some situations I find difficult to say no because I don't feel I have the right to. In a cuddle puddle, how do I justify a yes to one person and a no to another? It feels icky. Yep, I can relate to that. And I don't really have a solution other than remembering that. And sometimes we have to just like make ourselves remember, oh yeah, right. I am responsible for my body. Nobody else can be responsible for my body. And that's my job. Yeah. And it's definitely true that in some situations, it's harder to say no than other situations. Of course it is. And there are some situations in which we feel like, yeah, it's fine to say no. Other situations where it may be harder, because we're more afraid of losing the connection or we don't feel we have a right to. And so the ways that we have been playing with this are um, some ways to, to start exploring and start becoming more empowered with your no. Um, 
hesitation that hints at no more than yes. I'm not sure what that's referring to. Maybe it was um, how the maybe feels. Yeah. Oh, hesitation that hints at no more than yes. Okay, yep, that makes sense. Yeah. Hmm. Sometimes I feel there's pressure from spiritual or conscious communities to override our nervous system. Oh, fuck yes. I am so sorry to say that, but I think it's really true. Um, and our nose in the name of evolution, which I often see navigating related dynamics. That is so true. Um, which leads me to another point about saying no. So there are times, so this idea that we should override our no in the name of evolution, it's very similar to, well, I should be, I should be cool with spanking, even though I'm not, I should be cool with spanking. Why don't I just like stretch myself and try it, even though I don't think I'm going to like it. Anybody ever tried things like that? Yeah. It's a very common thing to try to push ourselves past where we think our limit is. It's very common. And the idea is that there's something we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be more okay with this. We're supposed to be more evolved. We're supposed to be more spiritual. We're supposed to be freer and more available. And we're supposed to be more generous. So all these things tend to like push us past where we're actually hearing our no. There's a problem with that. It doesn't work. Because it, it, because in order, we, it comes back to that same question about generosity. If I am responsible for my limits, and I'm res and, and when I respect my limits and have the skills to say no and say stop, then I relax. And when I relax, pleasure can happen. And then I find out what pleasure actually is because I am respecting my limits and my boundaries. And when I can do that, I relax and also because I learn to trust myself, then I naturally become more curious about trying new things because I trust my no. If I can't trust my no, there's no way I'm going to try something new because I don't know if I can handle it. And why would I do that? So it's kind of this odd thing that being very clear about our no allows us to relax. And we find that, oh, you know what? That, that actually does look kind of interesting. I think I might actually want to try that because I can trust myself to say no when I'm in the middle of it, if I need to. And there will be times when you look at something and you say, you know, that's a little edgy for me. I, it's like, oh, did I, I don't, did I, did I. anybody ever been there? You want to try something that's a little edgy? Of course you do sometimes. And what I say in cases like that is listen for the pull, not the push. So a push sounds like Oh, really, you know, you should be, you're just not cool enough. You really should be cool enough to do this thing because everybody says it's really rad. And what's wrong with you anyway? Just get over yourself. Anyone ever said that to themselves? Yeah. So that's a push. That's pushing you. Listen instead for the pull, which is, ooh, that looks really edgy, but it also looks really fun. I re I really want to try that, even though it scares the shit out of me. It's a very different inner voice. Have you ever heard that inner voice? I hope so. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So if there's something that's edgy, 
listen for the pull, not the push. Um, someone says intuition versus fear is a, in a no is a tough distinction. Yes. And I think fear is a very reliable source of information. Fear, what keeps you from jumping off of your roof is a fear because you know that the ground is there and it's going to break your neck. That's a very healthy use of fear. And fear is a body response which gives us information about danger or perceived danger. And that information allows us to say, no, I'm not going to do that because it's dangerous. And that is a, that's a really important thing to learn to trust our fear. So that gets back to the push and the pull. Suppose, you know, well, I'm afraid of getting close to this person, not because they're dangerous, but because I fear my own tenderheartedness, or I fear, you know, I, I fear that I'll just fall in love and then I'll be hurt eventually. Well, welcome to being a grown up. We fall in love and love hurts sometimes. I don't mean that you should be, let me clarify that. Um, I don't mean that you should let your loved ones hurt you. What I mean is that they will be disappointed and love relationships change and they end at some point. So that in that sense, we can get hurt. Um, so you may be saying, okay, well, I'm afraid to relax and become intimate with this person because uh, I'll be too tenderhearted. Well, you may be. And that fear is a sign that there's something in you that needs some tending. And so you get to tend to it in whatever way, with whatever tools, in whatever time frame is most useful for you. Um, so I don't. I don't necessarily put intuition and fear in opposing corners when talking about these things because um, fear is really good information for us about what we're ready for and what we're not ready for and about where we might need some tending and some mending of our hearts. Yeah. Hmm. So to, to wrap up and restate the role of generosity or generosity does not come from pushing yourself to try new things or pushing yourself to give more than you are comfortable giving or pushing yourself because you think you're supposed to give more. The source of generosity is honoring your no, gaining the skills to say no in all the various ways that you do say no, gaining the skills to say no and becoming comfortable with taking responsibility for your limits. That creates generosity within those limits that you have, that you're honoring. Yeah. So that's the that's the um, that's it in a nutshell, and I've covered kind of what I was going to cover. So I want to open it up to more questions, and we have one here to tackle the second one first. How do I manage rejection? Anybody else have a challenge with being rejected? Yeah, I do. I think we all do in different different situations. I think it can help to remember that the if you are if there's an act activity that you want that the other person doesn't want. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting the, the option or the activity, usually. 
there could be time. Not everyone's going to like us. And that's the way of it. Welcome to the grown up world. Not everyone's going to like us. And there will be some people who say, no, I don't want to do that with you, but I'd like to do something else with you. Or there are people who are going to say, I don't want to do anything with you. And I don't have any cure for the sadness and perhaps anger that's going to come from that. It's just going to come. Um, I, I don't have any cure for that, that kind of grief other than feeling it. Um, but, but I do think it's helpful to notice that is this person rejecting me? Or is this person saying no to this thing that I want to do that they don't want to do? And noticing that there is a difference can really, um, can really make a difference for you. And I think it also means that we, that it implies that if I'm going to ask for something, I need to notice that it's not, uh, that it's not about me. It's not who I am. The fact that I want to ask you for a massage is not about me. It's about this activity that I want. So it's separating our self from our desires. Um, what questions could I use to help me and the other person set boundaries with one another? That's a great question. So here are some things, that, and, and there are some people who develop this better than I do, but here's some ideas. You could ask what interests you, what excites you, what turns you off. Are there things that, that you don't want to do today? Are there things that you do want to do today? Are there things that, um, you know, if, if I'm interested in this, are you also interested in this? Those kinds, of, and I would welcome anyone else to, to put questions in the chat of, or let me just turn it around. If someone was trying to find out from you what your boundaries were, in a given relationship or event, how would you want them to ask you? What would you want to hear as a question um, to help you clarify what your boundaries are? What kind of a question would you like to be asked about that? And go ahead and put those in the chat. I would want to hear, uh, what are you a no to today? Um, or what are you a no to with me? What other ways would you like to be asked what your boundaries are. Are you okay with X, Y, Z would be another one. Um, or what sounds fun to you would be another one. And if you're really feeling brave or you have a pretty established relationship, you could say, what, um, what totally turns you off? I'm kind of in the mood for, would you be open to that? That's a great one. Yeah. 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 Does that help for the person that was asking? I use a full BDSM check kink checklist with different columns for experience level, interest and intensity. That's great. Yes, we revisit the checklist at a predetermined cadence. And then in play, we use the stoplight system. So we have just, we just have to ask, give me a fucking color. <laughs> That's great. The stop sign being system being, um, 
red for, green for go ahead, yellow for slow down or we're at the edge and red for stop. And this is this comment is coming from a person who's a, a professional dominatrix. Um, and I, I understand that that's pretty common in the BDSM um, play communities as well. Yeah. And to add blue before green for go harder. <laughs> that sounds great too. Yeah. So I want to open it up. We have about 15 minutes. I want to open it up to other questions about the wheel of consent and or generosity, giving and receiving. Um, I, I queued up a picture of the wheel in case you want to see it. Uh, do you want to see that? It's a simplified version. There we go. Sharing my screen. So I said a moment to, or back at the beginning of the talk that, that if we divide up those four interactions into who's doing and who's done to, that's the top you're doing and the other person's doing. And giving meaning it's for them, receiving meaning it's for you. Then you have, if you're doing and you're giving, I call that serving. And if you're doing and it's for you, you're, yeah, I call that taking. Taking is a problematic word for lots of reasons. You can go read about it elsewhere. And if you are being done to and you're giving, you're giving your, your body, you're allowing. And if you're being done to and it's for you, you're, you're accepting the gift that this person's giving you. So in the serve accept dynamic, this is a typical for a massage, for example, or a hand job. The server is taking action for the benefit of the acceptor, or most people call this receiving. In the take allow dynamic, the doer is doing what they want for their own enjoyment, and the allower is allowing them to do that. So the gift in here is the gift is access to the to the allower's body. The gift in this dynamic is the gift is the action of the, the server. And you can, um, you can download that in a much more complex one on my website, bettymartin.org. And there's bunches of hours of free video on that website and um, a free copy of the uh, first chapter of my book the wheel of consent, so help yourself. And I think those will be linked somewhere, yeah. Questions about any of this? Ahas, reflections, questions. It's been fun hanging out with y'all. Hmm. I think if there's any other pearls of wisdom that must come forth, right? No, I'm not thinking of any, so. Do you have a question coming up? I see you reaching for the, for the, <laughs> Okay, then I think we're done. Thank you all. I so enjoyed hanging out with you. I hope this was useful. Um, you can get plenty more on YouTube. Look up Betty Martin or the Wheel of Consent and uh, a whole page of eight hours worth of free video on my website, bettymartin.org. All right, Betty, it looked like there was one more question in the chat. Oh, oh okay. Thank you. I didn't see it. Let's see, question above, oh, okay. Oh, how does the, oh, this is a great question. Thank you for pointing it out, I missed it. How does the wheel work in relation to threesomes or multi? Um, fabulous. So that it, we, it applies in that you may have 
more than one person receiving. So, and a great example is the four-handed or six-handed massage. Um, the person on the table is receiving and the, they have multiple people serving them. For the take allow dynamic, it can be, uh, it can kind of go both ways. You could have two takers and one allower or two or more takers and one allower. Um, so that maybe several people are feeling up the allower or several people are climbing around the allower. Um, in which case, the allower needs to have a very highly developed ability to say no or stop because it can get overwhelming quite easy. You can also have one taker and several allowers. So you might have one hand feeling up this person and the other hand feeling up this person. So you have a person kind of on either side of you and you're fondling them both as an example. So yes, absolutely. It works with any number of people. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Thanks for asking it. Okay. That's a great note to end on. I hope you all have many opportunities for such fun in your lives. Thanks for joining me. <laughs>